On this tape, I'm going to be teaching about the uh, Taiji broadsword, or big knife, as they call it in China. This sword, or big knife, is probably one of the most deadly weapons, edged weapons, that is, apart from maybe the spear ever invented. However, it's not that deadly nowadays, of course, because you really can't walk down the street with something like this strapped to your side. You'd be picked up by the police in most modern countries. So nowadays, what we look at in this particular sword form are the huge health benefits that were built in by the generations of genius who invented it. This form can do amazing things, not only in the self-defense area, if you were living in ancient China and you were allowed to walk down the street with this thing. It defeats other swords, it defeats any sorts of weapons, except maybe the spear, but the health benefits are huge, in that, like the, ch the Taiji form itself, it helps you to balance out the yin and yang energies in your body, as well as things like uh, the amount of hormones in your body, chemicals, and even elements in your body. Minerals, for instance. There are movements built into this form, as in the old yang style, not so much in the new yang ching fu form, but in the old yang style, that even go so far as to help to prevent you from getting things like osteoporosis by keeping an adequate supply of calcium going to your bones. It's been discovered in uh, modern science, modern medical science, that through, dis through um, experiments with school children over many, many years and into their later lives, that those kids who did high impact exercises like jumping, jolting movements, had almost no osteoporosis into older age, whereas other kids who only did things like walking and swimming and stuff like that, uh, they had the normal amount of osteoporosis. And the Chinese knew about this, of course. They didn't know about maybe about osteoporosis as such, but they knew about how to balance the body so that your body keeps supplying you with the correct nutrients for the rest of your life. Of course, if, if we as Westerners, and unfortunately it's a trait of Westerners, sit down in front of the television as couch potatoes, your brain simply says, okay, this guy's dead, so uh, let's not bother putting any more calcium into the bones, for instance, or other things into your body to keep you alive. So what these forms, parts of these forms have are really jolty type of movements to literally sort of say to the brain, hey, I'm still alive here, keep, me, keep giving my bones some calcium so that uh, they'll stay, stay strong because I need them to do this sort of stuff. And your brain goes, whoa, yeah, let's put some calcium into those bones. He's doing all these high impact movements. So that's basically the reason that I do this form it also comes in, well, you know, the empty handed stuff in Tai Chi is unsurpassed in any martial art. It's just the real stuff I'm talking about the Fa Jing, the Dim Mak, the continuous striking, etc., etc. But with this form, I get mainly the health benefits. And I've experimented with myself, and it truly is amazing the health benefits that this form does give. There are. Uh, the names of the, each posture, I'll be putting those when I finish this, I'll be, you'll see the names come up as I do in uh, stalk, step back and ride tiger, stalk spreads wings, snake leaps down, and so I'll be putting them up on the screen for you so that you know the names. And there are a few attributes that you must learn, there are 12 of them, in this particular form. And it said that someone watching you must be able to see those attributes. However, you don't have to really know, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do an uppercut here or an undercut here, etc. You don't have to know that because they're built into the form. And if you're doing the form correctly, then you, you're already doing those particular movements. There's an uppercut, uh, there's an undercut, a cross cut, a chop, a split, a lift, a stab, a block and strike, pulling and a spiral movement like, pulling in a spiral movement like this. There's a push and there's a join and a, join in a parry movement in the whole form. So someone watching you must know and see that you're doing these movements. But as I say, they're built into each movement of the form. And the names of the form will dictate, like it might have something like uh, stalk threads, wings, or uppercut, or something like that. So you'll know when you're doing those attributes in the form anyway. There are other things 
the whole body and the knife must be coordinated together, as in the empty hand forms, of course, but more so with this because you've got a bloody big heavy knife in your hands. So your body must compensate for the knife often being fully extended. So your body and your hands must be absolutely coordinated. The body and the sword or the knife must move as one unit, as in the Taiji form, the whole body moves, you see the whole body just moving as a unit from finish from start to finish. And it's the same as this. There mustn't be any movements like, for instance, like that's just an arm movement, you see? Like, whereas, wah, that's the whole body doing the movement. Or no, never like that, it's wah. See, the whole body shaking. And it's exactly the same as the empty-handed stuff. There must be fudging in the movements. This form, a lot of people do it slowly, which is absolutely incorrect. This form must be done with fudging, explosive energy movements and it is a very explosive form. You can do it slowly to learn the movements, which you have to, of course, but eventually it's done at the full pace with very devastating farding movements. All the movement must, as I demonstrated then, as in the empty-handed form, comes from the waist. Never just one move with the arm. It's, oh, it's always with the waist turning left, right, left for a farding movement. In this form, as in the empty-handed forms, the, your attack must also be your defence, and your defence must also be your attack. So never once do we sort of go, ah, ah. That move would be, Hua! like that, you see? There's your defence and there's your attack. So your defence becomes your attack. Or, see, there's, there's a defensive move there, parrying his sword or his arm, whatever it is, and there's your defensive movement. It's exactly the same as in the empty hand forms, of course. You should always try and, of course, you, th this comes in line with your empty handed stuff, you should always manage to try and master an, the empty handed form before you go into this. Because all of the attributes that are in the empty handed form have to be in this, uh, this knife form. It's much more difficult to get the Tai Chi attributes, the Tai Chi essence, if you like, just starting out with, with the broadsword form or the sword form or any weapon form, really. That's why you always learn the Taiji empty-handed forms first. The hands. It's said that someone watching you in the single sword, for single knife form, watches to see what the hands are doing, to see if you're doing it correctly. For instance, if I hold it like this, incorrect. See how really stiff the hand is there? But if I hold it like this, the thing will fall out of my hands. It must be a not stiff but not too light grip so that you can get that, that far jing. See the move? See how the end of the... See how it sort of... This end pushes the end forward so you get a wave going up the thing. The only way to get that... See how I'm holding...